As a person who wasted half my life with Cartoon Network on TV, I see videos and articles that say 10 obscure cartoons no one remembers, and it's usually stuff like Squirrel Boy, and I'm insulted like you call that obscure. Pathetic. It's a shame more people can't waste their lives knowing useless cartoon knowledge like I do. So these are 10 obscure things aired on Cartoon Network no one remembers. Specifically in America. There's some stuff overseas that's worth its own video, but for now, it's juice and jam time. Hey, my threads, baby! How come I've never seen that itchy and scratchy before? Perhaps because you are a prepubescent ignoramus? Hi, um, I'm Moxie, and uh, uh... Tell me, what is considered the first original Cartoon Network program? Dexter? Johnny? Swatcats? No, it's The Moxie Show from 1993. And now, it's time for The Moxie Show! All this was, really, is a programming block of old Hanna-Barbera shows mixed between bumpers of Moxie and his flea hanging out. What's interesting is this was created with a motion capture suit animating the character voiced by comedian Bobcat Goldthwait in front of a practical, physical set. If you're not familiar with Bobcat's comedy, you may remember his voice as that red imp from Disney's Hercules. Hey, flea! What did they do before television? Well, they uh, discovered new continents, they, uh, they made major breakthroughs in medicine. Sometimes the Moxie show was even done live on TV to banter with callers during commercial breaks. It's very impressive for 1993, a cartoon being done live. It beats The Simpsons at doing the very same thing over two decades later in 2016. Now to take your calls, let's go to Hannah. Hi there, Aren't Homer. You... My question, my question yes. for you is... Who do you like more, Lenny or Carl, and why? It's weird. The Moxie Show is considered the first Cartoon Network original, although it's something no one, not even the channel, ever acknowledges, and many of its episodes remain lost. There are symphonies written. Wow, good thing they invented television, huh? That's for sure. Made us smarter. Are you looking for a place where you can laugh? <laughs> and snort? <laughs> For preschoolers, Nickelodeon has Nick Jr., Disney has Playhouse Disney, and Cartoon Network had Tickle You. Never heard of it? It only lasted two years, starting in 2005. Yet I can still find rant videos about it made just months ago as I write this. Enjoy, Tickle You. More like Stinky You. Oh my god. This preschool block sucks. Okay, normally I would say to these people, dude, chill. Move on with your life. It's a block no one remembers for preschoolers at 9 a.m. when you should be at school or I'm hoping work. But then I realize my career is doing just that. Damn it. Knock, knock. Who's there? Butter. Butter who? Butter, bring an umbrella. Looks like rain. This block even has two hosts. They look ugly, don't they? In my eyes, it seems like they want to rip off every woman's vaginas without giving a crap about the police. Tickle You faced stiff competition from Playhouse Disney and Nick Jr., and it was just weird to have a preschool block on the same channel as Adult Swim. It also went under fire from parent groups complaining how this block offers no educational value when Tickle You claims to help develop your child's sense of humor, when in reality these were merely comedy cartoons that were age appropriate and nothing more. It's like saying, we're teaching your kids to feel human emotions. But guess what is the worst part? This useless piece of shit actually aired Peppa Pig. No. In even more shadier business moves, Tickle You partnered with hospitals to host humor workshops that really were meant to introduce parents to this block's existence. It was seen as nothing but a shameless marketing ploy, and Cartoon Network would rather cut all ties with it. They make funny noises too. Tickle You, coming in August to Cartoon Network. This concludes my rant. Thanks for watching. <laughs> What you're seeing is the cartoon titled Grim and Evil, but some of you may eject, this is just Billy and Mandy. No, 
this was called Grim and Evil. I'm showing my age here because most people today who know Billy and Mandy don't know Grim and Evil. For many of the first Cartoon Network originals like Dexter's Lab or Two Stupid Dogs, they had to share their 30 minute air time with other cartoons like Secret Squirrel or The Justice Friends. The Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy used to share its time slot with Evil Con Carne, a sort of G.I. Joe villains parody where these bad guys plot to take over the world. I could explain the plot more, but the intro sums it all up. Once upon a time, there was a jillionaire playboy who was blown up in a tremendous explosion. His brain survived. Stomach too! And was attached to the body of a stupid circus bear. I am that brain. My name is Hector Concarne, and I will one day rule the world! Because working on two different universes in the same show was too difficult for the crew of one show, Grim and Evil split into their own cartoons. Billy and Mandy was the more popular one and thus kept around way longer, while Evil Concarne is locked away like the separated Siamese twin living in the attic. We've all had one of those, don't lie. What the from 1985, continuing to the time of making this video, one of Taiwan's most popular and longest running TV shows is Peely, a marionette action drama going on for 30 plus years. Obviously it's huge over there, but it's something America would have no interest in, until some old dirty bastard network executive decided to bring it to America and completely revamp it. Protect your neck, cause this is Wulin Warriors Ninja! Wulin Wulin Warriors! I'm Long Sword with my training brother Skull. We on a mission to try to find the missing seven stars. So Wulin, the scarab is bent, I'm Wulin the land. Grab the Wulin sword. I'm glad Martin Screlly finally released the Lost Wu Tang album. Wulin sword style. Holy balls. You want to talk butchered Americanization? It's obvious they completely rewrote the script into a totally different show. This guy with a scar named Scar doesn't even talk in the original and is constantly talking about pizza or saying dude. You know what this means? Uh, pizza party? No, it means we must return to the academy. To eat pizza? What? No, to consult with the oracle. The pizza oracle? There is no pizza oracle, Scar. <sighs> So you keep telling me. God. And they're constantly reusing the same footage of Scar, except they're flipping the footage so his Scar keeps changing places. Is this a joke or do they not care? The people behind the Toonami action block on Cartoon Network where this aired on never wanted anything to do with this show. They were forced to air it because it was so cheap. I remember the meeting where the guys who adapted Woolen Warriors came to us and pitched it and told us it's, it's this huge show there's all these episodes we're making 13 we're rewriting it to be right for american audiences and i distinctly remember feeling in the meeting <laughs> this sounds like a really bad idea current our head of programming at the time asked our opinion what do you guys think and we said uh this looks like a disaster and we don't want to do this and they said cool and then they went and made the deal anyway <laughs> so they got it super cheap i think like, I still remember watching this with my cousin and we were just confused, yet laughing our asses off. What is this? It was terrible, it only aired two times and it was gone, which is a shame. It's so fucking awful, I wish we got more out of it. But I will admit, the action scenes are pretty impressive for a show about marionettes. All I can say is, Wulin Warriors, it ain't nothing to fuck with. <laughs> Things rotten in the kingdom of Zoravia! No, not that. Originally starting off as shorts for America Online's web service and being dumped between commercials on Cartoon Network, it's 2003's Princess Natasha, about this exchange student who was a princess and became a spy when moving to America. Student, secret agent, princess. It's like Star vs. Kim Possible, only awful. But hey, let's have the intro explain the most convoluted premise since the intro to Hammer Man. Beloved King Carl's older brother Lubeck has launched a series of attacks to try to capture the throne. And disguised as an ill-mattered school principal, Lubeck plots his next dastardly feat. No, only Zoravia's top secret agent, Princess Natasha, who also happens to be King Carl's daughter and Lubeck's niece, 
can stop Lubeck and save Zoravia. Disguised as an exchange student. No, not that disguise. That disguise. Princess Natasha lives with the O'Brien family and goes to Fountain. Did you catch all that? It's nothing interesting and was just cheap filler during commercials. These were animated in Flash at a time when not too many people even knew what Flash animation was. Even as a kid, this looked so cheap and I was worried, thinking, this is the future of animation? Ugly Flash animated shows? Will this happen to every cartoon from now on? <laughs> Princess Natasha made me fear the future. But we can see that's not the case, and many studios were able to do great things with Flash. It's all about the artist, not the tool. If someone can recreate the Mona Lisa in primitive MS Paint, animators can do amazing things with Flash. I guess we can appreciate Princess Natasha for being among the first to work with this technology on TV. Hello, this is Ed. Stay tuned for more Cartoon Cartoon Fridays. Don't we air Scooby do enough? You gotta take over Cartoon Cartoon Fridays too? <laughs> <laughs>you're walking through Best Buy, you're in the DVD section, you're thankful digital distribution hasn't wiped out DVDs yet, and you see this on the shelf. What can you even say? This is part of the Thumb Movie parody franchise. You get a movie, put some thumbs in it, put some faces on the thumbs, it's a thumb movie. I want to see the universe! You don't know who I am inside! You never have! I'm gonna run away and never come back ever! Is it a ripoff of the Annoying Orange? Nope. The earliest Thumb special was 1999's Thumb Wars, a parody on Star Wars, though the technique of real faces over stuff is called Synchro Box, and it dates back to the 50s with Clutch Cargo. If there were thumbs in space and they got mad at each other, there would be... Right before the premiere of 2008's Star Wars The Clone Wars, CN played this as an opening act, along with the other Thumb movies. If I saw this on TV, I would change the channel, which I did when I saw Franken-Thumb. This was baffling, like, really? You had nothing else to air? In terms of ratings, Cartoon Network is always third place behind Disney and Nickelodeon. Likely they had no money and they just got whatever they could find for cheap and this was it. Though when you're third place behind the ratings, you have less to lose. Ergo, you experiment more, and that's why I always prefer Cartoon Network. They're more experimental with their stuff. Any other comments? I have a question. Why do we all speak in British accents when we're from outer space and there is no Britain? <laughs> The humor in these thumb films are as dumb as you'd expect, but I'm not afraid to praise the physical props they constructed for this. These were all written by Steve Odekirk, the founder of O Entertainment, most known for Jimmy Neutron, which he co-created. He's also a writer and screen player for Kung Pao, Enter the Fist, Barnyard, and Jim Carrey movies like Bruce Almighty. Don't get too excited, he also did Evan Almighty. I'm impressed something so stupid could be done by somebody with such a portfolio, yet the more I searched into this man's history, the more terrifying things became. He does, after all, have a history of... CG animation. In the 90s. Duh. I want to get off the ride. I want to get off Mr. Bones' wild ride. That's all that needs to be said. Attention, tune heads. You know who you are. Now here's your chance to truly know your tunes. With the only 30-minute TV show guaranteed to satisfy your appetite for Twisted Tunes. This is what I wish we got more out of. Documentaries about cartoons. That was the show Tune Heads, mostly covering the history of animation by MGM, Warner Brothers, and Hanna-Barbera. Episodes were themed around a particular artist, character, or topic. Like one about all the World War II cartoons with all the racist caricatures no one likes to bring up. See how your favorite cartoon heroes entertained and comforted the home front by fighting the battle on the front line as June Heads takes a look at the wartime cartoons. Sunday night at 10 on Cartoon Network. That's pretty bold of them.
While Disney chooses to alter or outright ban certain cartoons, Warner Brothers feels it's better to let people understand why this was wrong and let them learn from history than to ignore it ever happening. People and times change, but we shouldn't alter art made at a time to fit current standards. Toonhead should be brought back. I'm sure kids would love to know how cartoons are made. On the contrary, with the internet now, anyone with editing software can roughly teach the same thing. Even people like me when we're not getting mad at preschool shows and writing analysis videos on why a joke for children wasn't funny to me as an adult. Serious stuff for the true tunophile. So be prepared, tune heads will roll tonight at 10 on Cartoon Network. Before the internet, one of the few ways to expose yourself to random animated shorts were compilation TV shows bundling them all together in 30 minute blocks, like 1995's What a Cartoon Show, where the likes of Dexter and Powerpuff got their start, and also Family Guy in a way. Alright, I, I, mean, I, I didn't spend 12 years in kindergarten because I'm stupid. Why then? I got my foot caught in a radiator. Here, let me see this. But that's a story for another time. What a Cartoon Show gave the channel its biggest hits, and later they would try their hand at a more artsy compilation show. 1997's O oh Canada, featuring, you guessed it, Canadian shorts. Cartoon Network would like to say thanks, neighbor, with O oh Canada. 30 minutes of the Great White North's cleverest natural resource. I vaguely remember watching these and getting scared at how surreal these got. Canada! In 2005, there was Sunday Pants, a display of cartoons from different companies separate from Cartoon Network in between performances by the band The Slacks. It only lasted five episodes, and for some reason, they got away with more adult language. Dude, what the hell is going on? Nothing notable came out of Sunday Pants, as that'd be the last compilation series to air on the channel. Cartoon Network now reserves shorts to be dumped either online or between commercials, like with their Wedgies segment. Wedgies! There was Nacho Bear, where this bear was trying to find a nacho. Cat 22, it's about a secret agent cat. Big Baby, a uh, big baby runs amok. Stuff happens and somehow saves the day. The Bremen Avenue experience, the more visually appealing of the shorts, showing off this garage band of kids. That one pig horse looks like young JG Quintel. But my favorite was the talented Mr. Bigsby, this working man who's trying not to screw up at his job. School career counselor, hit by a van, need you to fill in. Don't hit the kids. The final compilation series Cartoon Network made was the never released Cartoon Institute. I know it's supposed to be a pun on Institute, but I first thought it was a pun on Prostitute. Over half the shorts were unfinished, so they dumped what was done online. What made these special is they were created without network notes, meaning no restrictions like an executive telling them to take blank out or change this thing, which explains why we got stuff like Joey to the world. And where, pray tell, would you be going? To a place every man needs to go just to prove he's still a man. A whorehouse? No, silly goose. I think they forgot to tell the creator this was intended for kids. Why was the Cartoon Institute unfinished? Well, it was in development during 2009, the year Cartoon Network just gave up and said, we're doing live action shows now. Thankfully, the live action stuff failed and we're back to Cartoon Network. The Cartoon Institute never made it to TV, but this was the start for regular show and Uncle Grandpa. Now, let's switch over to a Midnight Society video. Let's make things spooky. What I'm about to discuss aren't even shows or blocks, but glitches that I catch on the channel. Nothing's more obscure than something that could have aired only once. Every so often, I sleep until 6am just when Cartoon Network switches back from Adult Swim. Often, I find technical glitches at these hours no one should be watching. Understandable, not too many people would remember them. But there was a premiere episode of regular show, The Power Tower, that was first broadcasted with a corrupted color scheme. Obviously, a lot of people saw it, and some assumed it was a redesign. But it's just an error and no explanation was ever given as to what happened. Oh, he's going behind the head for the hand clasp. I think he's gonna do it! I think he's... <laughs> 
But for this last one, I hope someone else saw this. It was a Sunday morning sometime near 2009. I woke up around 9am central time, turned on the TV and left it on to Cartoon Network while I fell back to sleep as sort of background noise. But this time was different. My Dish Network info said what I was watching was Tom and Jerry. But on screen clearly was not Tom and Jerry. It was some sort of weird foreign film, possibly Russian. I heard a choir of elderly sounding men singing to some opening credits in another language. The footage was grainy and looked like it was from the 60s. All I could remember was the view of a forest and cutting to a kid in the water while an old man checks up on him. That's all I remember before I decided to go back to sleep. If anyone knows what I saw, hit me up. It's a possible glitch, I'm still curious as to what it was. By the way, I made a checklist of today's topics. Be sure to post how many of these you remembered. Canada, our industrious neighbor to the north, renowned for its production of lumber, mounties, and great cartoons. Every spring, the fertile Canadian soil gives forth a rich bounty of exotic native animation. Cartoon Network would like to say thanks, neighbor, with O Canada, 30 minutes of the great white north's cleverest natural resource. Tune in to Cartoon Network tonight at 9.30, and you too will say, O Canada, you make some mighty fine cartoons.